Cool. So thank you for inviting me. I'm going to be talking about um, addressing socioeconomic inequality in education. And there's four questions that I hope to be able to get time to answer. So the first thing I'm going to briefly discuss is what I see as socioeconomic inequality. So I think it's important at the outset to have a clear definition of what I see socioeconomic inequality as. I'm briefly going to discuss what the UK is currently doing to try and address socioeconomic inequality. I'd then briefly like to discuss what the UK should be doing to address it. And then, if possible, I'd like to discuss some empirical work that I've done in primary schools in the UK and set, see how the approach I'm arguing for would work in the UK. Um, quickly, I just want to say why I'm focusing on education. So lots in, there's lots of areas where socioeconomic inequality has an impact, so health, uh, the job market, etc. But in terms of education, I think that's one of the most important areas because it's an area that all children have to participate in by law. Um, it's often where these inequalities are first measured, where they can be developed, where they can be dealt with. So in the UK, attending a good school is more important to someone's future success and their family background and their income. So it can have a really important impact on a person's life. It's also very personal for me. So this is me on my first day of school quite a few years ago. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in Bullwell in Nottingham North in the UK. Uh, Bullwell is the seventh most deprived area of the UK. Nottingham North has the lowest uh, proportion of children going to higher education in the country. So these are issues that are very personal to me, which is also why I've chosen education. So in terms of my first question, what is socioeconomic inequality? So I like to think of socioeconomic inequality as kind of a really tall building. And uh, historically, what uh, scholars, policymakers have focused on is poverty. So raising people up to, say, the fifth floor of a building. However, the problem with just focusing on poverty is that it doesn't also take account of economic inequality. So while you're focusing on getting people up to the fifth floor, say, to above the poverty line, the building can be getting taller and taller and taller, which raises your poverty line. So you're always facing a losing battle trying to get people out of poverty. So I also think you need, as well as poverty, to focus on economic inequality, so the differences between the poorest and the richest. But even then, which is what I'm going to focus on quite a bit, that's not enough. You also, there's also in society lots of barriers to, pe to people moving up society. So if someone is um, intelligent it's, but poor, it's often more difficult to succeed than if you're richer and, uh, but less intelligent. So we also need to focus on class, which is what I'm going to talk about quite a bit today, so we can remove these barriers and hopefully have greater uh, so, uh, social mobility. So they're the three aspects that I think are important that we have to focus on if we want to address socioeconomic inequality. You need to address all three to comprehensively address it. So lots of people have spoken about poverty, economic inequality, so I'm not going to focus too much on them. But I am briefly going to discuss class because it's not been discussed um, kind of explicitly during the conference and um, there's lots of different meanings of it. So I focus on um, a Bourdieuian conception of class, so the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, and he outlines four different types of capital that everyone has. So economic capital, how much money someone has, symbolic capital, um, the esteem that's given to people depending on the capital, social capital, so how good your social connections are, and cultural capital. So that's how well educated you are, where you went to university, uh, how you engage with culture. So if you go to the cinema, if you go to like football, etc. And, and all these four things combined make up a person's class position. So in terms of education, a quite basic example how cultural capital takes place in education. Say students are studying the Egyptians. Um, some students will have already, with their parents, gone to a museum and maybe seen an exhibit about the Egyptians. So here this is the British Museum in London. And obviously, because they've already had this cultural experience, they find the subject matter easier, which results in a higher grade. However, these things aren't class neutral. So studies show that the people that take their parents, uh, they take the children to the museums, are middle class people. So it tends to be middle class children that do better at school because they've had these experiences. 
And also the curriculum is not class neutral. So traditionally the school curriculum focuses on things that middle class children find more interesting. So it, this alienates a lot of working class children. So this is a basic example of how the curriculum kind of reinforces um, class divides. So just to illustrate the levels of socioeconomic inequality in the UK, um, 30 million people are currently living in poverty in the UK. So we've got a population of just over 60 million, so it's quite high. 70% of capital is held by the top 10% of the population. And in a survey of 52 OECD countries, class was found to have a bigger impact on education than in any of the other developed countries that were surveyed. Usually, these statistics would be very shocking when I'm speaking in the UK or Europe, uh, but unfortunately, I'm in the one developed country with higher levels of socioeconomic inequality. So these actually aren't as bad as are present in the US at the moment. So, uh, what is the UK currently doing to address socioeconomic inequality? So there's four main mechanisms that have been used to try and address socioeconomic inequality. So we have a Child Poverty Act, which sets four requirements that the government has to try and meet in order to eradicate child poverty by 2020. However, although they've got a few years, it's virtually impossible that they're going to get anywhere close to meeting these targets. In fact, the new Conservative government has tried to change the targets, um, but this was rejected by the legislature. So it's not been very effective in addressing socioeconomic inequality. Some groups have also tried to use existing equality law, so on grounds of uh, race, sex, etc., because sadly, um, minority groups often tend to be poorer. So women in the UK tend to be poorer than men. Disabled um, individuals are poorer than non-disabled, etc. So they've tried to use equality law to challenge a lot of the austerity cuts, etc. But again, these, this has not been very effective um, because... The problem with a lot of equality law is that it requires someone to bring a case, and this can be very expensive, which acts as a barrier for poorer people to challenge these kind of issues. Um, there's also the European Convention on Human Rights. So there's uh, three mechanisms within that that um, people have tried to use to challenge socioeconomic inequality. So there's the Articles 2, 3, and 8, so that's the right to life, uh, freedom from uh, deprivation and torture, and the right to a family life. But the European Court of Human Rights have set a very high standard. So um, they've only really found that these things are wrong where there's some other um, factor. So uh, generally migrants, so it only really applies if they're also a migrant, not just poor. There's the right to education, but it requires very little. So it's just official recognition by the state of whatever studies you do. And the state has to regulate the education system. And there's Article 14, a non-discrimination um, clause, which includes things which aren't in the UK, such as social origin, property, and birth. However, again, the, the European Court of Human Rights has been found it very easy to justify these kind of things. And finally, we have the generally take a policy approach in the UK. So there's a child poverty policy, a social mobility policy. But the problem with the policy approach is that it lacks permanency, so uh, we'll have a policy for five years, government will change, they don't like it, they'll start a new policy. But by the very nature, these things take a long time. It, it takes years to uh, impact socioeconomic inequality. So constantly changing is counterproductive. Uh, policies often conflict, so I'm going to talk about one uh, later if I've got a bit of time. And it neglects issues of class, so it's built on a middle class model of, um, class, of, of parenting. So it requires, say... Um, it assumes that everyone should read to children. But again, this is not class neutral. If, if you're a working class parent, you work in two, three jobs, you're a single parent, you might find it difficult to buy the books. The libraries are closing, so you might find it difficult to access the books. You might not have time to read the books. But this policy assumes that all good parents should be doing that. And if you're not doing that, you're a bad parent. Um, so that's kind of what the UK is doing. And it's, it's as you can probably tell, not been very effective. <coughs> So there's been a lot of discussion in the UK about how we can address, use law to address um, socioeconomic inequality. So some people have been discussing socioeconomic rights um, and equality law, and I think these can be useful to address socioeconomic inequality. But in terms of the discussion in the UK, um, there's two kind of limitations. So one is that when they're discussing how these can address socioeconomic inequality, they're just looking at how they can address poverty, 
And as I said earlier, poverty, just addressing poverty is not enough. You also need to focus on economic inequality and class. And also, people tend to just, as lawyers, just focus on the role that the courts can play. But in particularly education, but lots of other areas, there's lots of other enforcement bodies that actually uh, would be more useful enforcing these uh, rights than uh, a court would be. So uh, how, how can law address socioeconomic inequality in the UK? So I think you do need both socioeconomic rights and equality law because they do different things. So socioeconomic rights is primarily about addressing poverty. So it's about ensuring everyone has the minimum basics needed. However, it's not going to be very good at addressing class. Equality law, especially in the UK, because we have positive duties, uh, mainstreaming duties, are better at addressing class, because if there's a barrier that prevents certain children, parents, from realising the potential, equality law requires, or could require, schools to remove these barriers and think about different ways they can do things that are more class neutral. So you need both to comprehensively address socioeconomic inequality. You also need measures to address economic inequality directly because it's only dealt with indirectly by socioeconomic rights and equality law because obviously the rights and equality law would require some spending and this is likely to come from the richer people but it's not necessarily uh, that way. So you do need specific uh, measures to address economic inequality, such as um, taxation, etc. But, because I'm focused on education, I'm not really going to talk about these, because education can only really have an indirect impact on economic inequality. And we also need to focus upon um, other enforcement bodies other than just courts, which I'll hopefully talk a bit briefly about. So, that's kind of the three questions. So what I want to talk briefly about now, uh, I think we've got about four minutes, is uh, my empirical research. So in, in the UK, we have something called the pupil premium. So the pupil premium is money that goes to each school for each poor child. So if you're a primary school child, you're one of the poorest in the country, the school gets £1,300, which they, they have to spend on improving that child's performance. So what I did was I went to nine schools across two cities in the UK um, and looked at how they were using the pupil premium. And um, I, got, I went to a range of schools. So this kind of shows how um, divided the UK is. So one of the schools only had 10% of the poorest children, whereas another had 80%. So within, within the cities, you've got this huge divide between poor schools and uh, schools that aren't particularly poor. <coughs> and there was kind of three themes that I noticed when I went into the schools. So one was there was a heavy focus on poverty. So the ones with a lot of poorer children, um, they tended to be more aware of kind of class issues. So usually I'd let you read these quotes, but I think it's probably a bit small, so I'll read them out. Um, so this is 65% of the poor children it costs money to engage in trips to see performances, visiting places of interest, participating in events, even going on holiday. This leads to a narrow range of experiences. So it recognises if, if you don't have money, you can't go to museums, you can't go to the theatre. So it restricts your opportunity to gain cultural capital. Um, but the school with very few um, pupil premium children kind of didn't recognise the importance of class. They just saw it as an issue of poverty. So parents of pupil premium children lack the education to know what is important for their family and don't know how to give the children a broad, supportive, enriching upbringing. Instead, they do things the way that the family has always done because that's quite traditional. So, they've, uh, so this is basically saying they're working class, they've got certain interests, but they're wrong. We don't recognise them within the education system. We're only interested in middle class interests. So you should be taking people to museums. You should be taking people um, to the opera, to concerts. You shouldn't be taking people to the cinema, etc. So basically what they're doing is wrong. They're bad parents. The second theme um, was limited eligibility. So in the UK, to be eligible for uh, the pupil premium, it's a very low bar. So you have to be receiving free school meals, which you only get if you're on benefits, 
um, and you have to actively claim. So it's, you can't, it's not just that you earn benefits, you also have to fill in a form. And what we've seen in the UK is that the bar is so low that there's 700,000 children that live in poverty that aren't eligible for the pupil premium, so they're not getting this money. And 14%, although they're eligible, are not claiming because the parents haven't filled in this form. So there's a lot of people that are poor but are not getting any additional help. And this led to a conflict between uh, moral and legal obligations. So some of the schools felt that the way this policy works, they have to use it for those children, whereas others felt that um, all, nearly all the children in the school were poor, so they tried to use it for all the children, even though that's not what they were meant to, because they felt a moral duty to help all the children, because if they were not receiving the pupil premium, it might be a matter of a few pounds, etc. Um, yeah. So that there was kind of this moral and legal obligation that they struggled with. And finally, enforcement. So I'll only talk about this really briefly. So often we tend to think that kind of courts are the answer to all these things. But in schools in the UK, the cases really get to court. So courts have no resonance in schools. They're not particularly intimidated by them. If, you th if they're thinking of uh, kind of what they're scared about, it's, it's not going to court. It's, it's just not possible. So in, in that context, focusing on courts enforcing equality law and human rights isn't that useful. What is useful and what they were really intimidated by is the school's regulator, Ofsted. So they're, they're inspected quite frequently. Um, so kind of my argument is that we need to move away from just focusing on courts when we're looking at enforcement. We also need to focus on lots of other bodies, so regulators, etc., because they have a lot more um, contact with the schools and are more likely to be able to make changes than um, courts. Uh, yeah, so I think I've got one more slide. Uh, so, yeah, I guess my final uh, thing would be, uh, well, we could just go to the next final slide. So final uh, slide, let's just summarize. Um, the three main things I'd want to kind of reiterate are that if we're focusing on socioeconomic inequality, we need to focus on poverty, economic inequality, and class. Just focusing on one or the other is insufficient. We need to focus on all three to be able to comprehensively address it. We need to take a wide variety of measures to address. So it, it's kind of not socioeconomic rights or equality law or taxation. They all do different things. They all address different aspects of socioeconomic inequality. So we need them all to comprehensively address it. And finally, we need to focus on enforcement bodies other than just courts, so regulators, etc. Um, and hopefully, so you, here I would have a picture of my last day of primary school, but it was too embarrassing. So instead, um, <laughs> we all painted a picture of ourselves on the wall. So obviously that's me in the middle. Um, but but the, reason, the reason I want to reiterate this point is, I, I left primary school 18 years ago, um, but still nothing's changed. Ball is still the seventh most deprived area in the UK. Uh, it still has the lowest proportion of people going to higher education in the country. So I think it's very sad that nearly 20 years nothing's changed. So hopefully one day these things will change. Thank you. So the, the namesake of this conference, Inequality and Human Rights, was uh, actually the, the same topic we looked at in the seminar taught by Karen Engel and, and uh, Julia Dem this past semester. And we spent the last fall kind of reading uh, studies or, or articles written by scholars, maybe even some of you here in the audience today and definitely some who spoke at this conference this weekend, um, just kind of about the interplay between human rights and inequality uh, and over various different um, regions and, and issues and, and different human rights in focus. Um, and we, we'd write responses to their work and, and we'd hold panels very similar to this one to kind of discuss uh, what we'd read. And we all ended up kind of undertaking our own research uh, in, in this area. And very quickly, just to kind of give the, the elevator speech version of what my research was focused on, uh, I focused in general on Latin America and in particular on the Mercosur member states, namely Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Venezuela, and to a lesser extent uh, included in my data will be 
uh, some of the associated member states uh, of Mercosur, which are other South American countries, most of them. Um, and very simply, I, I argue that Mercosur initiatives into the realm of uh, right to education may, may be perpetuating economic inequalities in, in some instances. Uh, and, and it's because they've done a great job of establishing kind of a, a basic floor of protection and ensuring basic primary and secondary education for all. Uh, in, in fact, the, the Millennium Development Goal of universal primary education in Latin America uh, was realized by 2015. Um, so undoubtedly a huge win um, for human rights. But one, one thing that I argue is, is that the establishment of these basic floors can, can serve to place blinders on policymakers and, and give them something to point back to and say, here's a, here's a, a victory for human rights. Um, and then focus on, or begin to shift their focus towards other, the other policy objectives. And particularly in the realm of education, what that leaves is a primary and secondary school system uh, that is um, at such a low level that, that it doesn't actually adequately prepare students to uh, embark at, in university education. And, and so then when government funding then shifts from primary and secondary level education to um, towards university tertiary education, then it's acting as a subsidy for the rich. Because the students who are forced to uh, attend public schools because they don't have the means to attend private secondary preparatory schools, um, you know, their chances of, of getting into a university or if they do, of succeeding at that university are much lower compared to their peers, uh, many of whom in, in these countries in Mercosur uh, attended uh, private, private schools. Um, so that's kind of the nutshell version. Um, M mentioning the seminar that we uh, had last fall, one author in particular had some work that was pretty controversial. It sort of some, stirred up some lively debate, and that was Samuel Moyne. Uh, he had a couple pieces. One was an article entitled, um, Do, Do Human Rights Increase Inequality? And then a longer article entitled, The Powerless Companion. And to briefly sum up his work, he argues that human rights, the human rights framework and uh, neoliberalism actually developed contemporaneously and against a common background. Uh, and, and so as you see kind of market fundamentalist reforms in, in Latin America, you see uh, the, the, the poor, the most vulnerable, without safety nets and, and are kind of vulnerable in, the, in this very quick economic development. And so human rights you know, developing contemporaneously with that uh, was, was a way to come in and begin to start conversation about these, these safety nets. Um, but one, one argument that he makes is that because of that, human rights and inequality, even gross inequality, can coexist. They can live in harmony, if you will, with each other. Uh, and that's because he views human rights as, as the establishment of a basic floor without really caring about a ceiling on, on overall wealth or overall uh, economic inequality. Um, so this argument, it, it challenged me, as, as it did, I think, some of the other students in, in the seminar, and it got me thinking if there were maybe regional cases that we could look into that could either confirm or deny Moyne's theory or at least give, me, give us something to, to apply it to and see if it, if it holds any water. And so I, I focused on one human right in particular, the, the right to education, and then obviously one regional context in, in Mercosur's educational initiatives. Um, and, I, and I considered what these, these initiatives, what, what effect they've had, if any, on the existing economic inequalities in the region. And so just by way of background, Latin America is, as many of you know, it's the most unequal region in the world. It has uh, higher rates of inequality even than sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia. Although over the past 20 years, it is, I will note that um, there, there's been a decline in income inequality over the past 20 years. Um, there was a, an IMF working paper published not too long ago in 2014 uh, that discussed this decline in income, you know, wage disparity that in the 90s, the average skilled worker was making four times the wage of, of an unskilled worker. Uh, today, that's 2.7 times. So it's 2.7 times the, the wage of, of an unskilled worker. So there definitely has been improvement, to be sure. Um, but in my research, I, I looked at that claim that income inequality has declined and that uh, this, this particular paper's claim that investment in education was the, the greatest, single greatest contributor to it. Um, and, I, and I, point, I point out two things. One is that it focuses solely on income inequality. It doesn't look at, at other, other uh, types of economic inequality, wealth inequality. It doesn't look at uh, you know, educational, uh, educational inequalities that exist. 
Um, and then secondly, it fails to, to take a stance on which level of education uh, government should be investing in. Uh, it, it specifically says that it, it, it's beyond the scope of that paper, um, but that increased educational spending is likely to lead to uh, a decline in inequality. And um, at least in, in this particular context, uh, I disagree. I, because of, of the way that Latin American educational systems are, are set up, and specifically these Mercosur initiatives, which I'll outline here in a moment, uh, pushing investment towards tertiary level education, which has steadily increased in Latin America uh, over, over the last decade, is essentially subsidizing those who uh, had been able to, to pay for secondary, private secondary education. Um, and so what, what are these Mercosur educational initiatives? Uh, so beginning in 1991, the ministers of, of education for these various Mercosur nations met, and, and they established this regional cooperation, um, similar to what the European Union has, similar to discussions that have occurred in NAFTA, uh, to have a regional integration of education systems, nothing out of the ordinary, uh, advanced research networks and, you know, the regional accreditation and recognition of professional degrees, academic degrees, and the like. And the basic goal was, was that. It was um, just an enhanced network and regional accreditation. And as a trade block, uh, obviously economic benefits were in mind, but interestingly enough and important for my research was that it actually had the stated goal of decreasing economic inequalities. And so here you have uh, a trade block promoting uh, this educational initiative with, with the focus of decreasing inequalities both regionally and within its member states. Um, and they, as they rolled this plan out, uh, there were three phases. And the first phase focused on primary and secondary education. Uh, and in my, in my research, I, I'm paralleling that to, to this floor of protection. Uh, they worked on teacher training. They, they invested in infrastructure. But interestingly, just a few years after starting the first phase, uh, the second phase kicked in and focus shifted completely to tertiary level spending. Um, and so I argue that that, it, that plays into this narrative of uh, how establishing a basic floor of protection gives leaders something to point to. I, I think I mentioned the Millennium Development Goal, uh, to point to that and say universal primary education. Uh, now, how can we get our country, our state, to be competitive now within this broader Mercosur framework? How can we get our professionals uh, to have an advantage over professionals of other states? And how can we get our research networks benefiting uh, within this, this regional cooperation? Um, and so it, it in effect, uh, it, puts, it places blinders on them, or, or uh, it's not intentional, obviously, but it's, it's using the human rights framework to discuss education kind of lends, lends to that. Um, and while spending on primary education benefits the whole of society, that spending is also proportionately less per student. Um, to give just a couple uh, examples from, from nations in Mercosur, Argentina, uh, a country with universal, um, I'm sorry, with, with free public education, universities are, are free, which hardly seems like a problem in discussions about inequality. Uh, but the problem is that 20%, I'm sorry, half of the students that attend these public universities that are uh, often more prestigious than the private universe, their private counterparts in, in these nations. Half of these students come from the, uh, the top 20th percentile of income, family income distribution, and 90% of them come from the top half. Uh, and also noteworthy is that half of these students, about 50% attended private schools uh, for secondary school. Brazil, sim similar numbers. Uh, except you have 70% of all university students coming from the, the top median of income distribution. And you also have the national government spending five times more per university student as, as they do per primary student, which university is, is more expensive, obviously, but, but that's the highest number in the globe, actually, the highest ratio in the globe. Um, and so with numbers like this, uh, my argument is, is that the right to education is, is at a risk of becoming a false entitlement that it's available to, to all, but it's often of such poor quality that the hopes of university education and the economic benefits that, that come with that uh, are, are often little less or little more than, than a dream. Um, and so why, why the rights education may not be the answer, why, why framing it in, in a human rights framework may not be the right answer, um, 
is that because we, we've seen educational equality um, lead to improved income inequality, but that number has actually stagnated in Latin America. And so we've seen investment and we've seen improvement in income inequality, but that is all but drawn to a close uh, at, at this point while investment education is still up. Um, and it, it would make sense because you have, you have more students graduating secondary school, so you have more students vying for coveted positions at universities, uh, but you also have more of an advantage to those who are, are better prepared. Um, and so making this a, a regional analysis of, of Samuel Moyne's point, the, the danger with, with focusing on um, or using human rights as our framework is, is that the, the, the danger of this floor of, prote of protection is that it's, it's a safety net blinding policymakers and, and it's allowing citizens to, at the very, very top, to enjoy benefits um, that are completely un unavailable to those at the bottom, uh, but we still have this, this floor to point to. Uh, and um, so the, the argument is, is that we have a possible confirmation of, of Moyne's theory. Um, the, the last part of my research really calls for more empirical data. Uh, these the countries in particular, all but Argentina, Chile, which is an associated member state, and Brazil, uh, they've stopped reporting a lot of their educational investment data uh, for, I'm, I'm not sure why, but uh, we would need to see what the trends are in the past four years, because um, as of 2011, several of these states uh, don't have any data reported. Uh, but it would be interesting to see if there has been an increase as Mercosur has, has continued to roll out uh, and regional cooperation has um, has kind of grown. Um, so I, I do offer this as a possible confirmation of, of Moyne's theory, and I appreciate you letting me share my research. Caroline. Okay, so great, good morning. I'm going to give you a very localized discussion on the right to education with specific emphasis on the Kenyan example, um, the free primary education policy in Kenya that was implemented in 2003. So <clears throat> building very closely on what Craig has spoken about and also what David spoke about as well, and of course why we are all in the same panel, you'll notice a lot of similarities in the, in the discussion and even the, the suggestions in as far as the way forward is concerned. So, of course, a bit, a bit of background in as far as education and its importance is actually concerned, which is the whole point of this particular discussion. I'm sure we all know the famous Pink Floyd, we don't need no education slogan, although clearly the use of the double negative there shows otherwise. Um, so yeah, education is important in very many ways and for very many reasons. I decided to start with an excerpt from the CSR, uh, General Comment on Education, I think General Comment 11, if I'm not mistaken. So they say that, and we had this discussion earlier on, uh, someone mentioned the issues of um, human rights, first generation versus second generation rights, you know, ESR has traditionally been subjugated to civil and political rights, but education or the right to education kind of is the perfect right to discuss whenever you're thinking about interdependence of human rights because of exactly that reason that education is both an economic right, it's a social right, it's a cultural right, it's all of this, and specifically it becomes a civil and political right as well because when people in any given community don't enjoy the right to education, they're not able to effectively enjoy their civil and political rights. So, of course, education is important. It epitomizes everything that we hold dear in as far as human rights uh, discussion are actually concerned. So a little history lesson in Kenya, and specifically primary education in Kenya. 1963, Kenya got independence, and uh, the independence government, the Kenya African National Union, had very many promises about the fact that they were going to give free primary education, but they remained just that for a very long time, election promises. 
In 1971, there was a presidential decree that was passed saying that tuition would be abolished in certain schools in Kenya, specifically schools in geographical regions where uh, potentially the conditions were not so favorable. So to kind of uh, even the pedestal for those students there, the government said, okay, no tuition fees. In 1973, they took this a little further and said that there'll be free primary education in class one to class four. Our education system at that time was 744, but now it's 844, going to move soon to 2633, and I'll explain that later on in the discussion. So they eliminated fees for part of the, the primary uh, education students, class one to class four, maintained fees for class five to seven, but reduced it significantly in order to encourage, of course, education, uh, more students to join. The problem with the way FBE has traditionally been implemented in Kenya and even with the most successful implementation in 2003 is that it always comes from a very political perspective, that it's, it's a promise that's made within the context of elections or the context of a new government. They don't put in place the policy measures necessary for it to be a sustainable policy that will actually work. So in 1988, it fails miserably. The government is not able to sustain you know, the payments uh, associated with the free primary education policy, so they have to abandon it. And of course, at the time, the SAPs, which are causing havoc all over developing countries, also kick in to make uh, free education a mirage. So now for that period of time between 1988 and 2003, there's no primary education for free, at least. So you have to incur the cost, which means that there was a very large number of children who were not able to access education at this time. So then in 2003, we have a new government, the National Alliance Rainbow Coalition, a coalition government that comes uh, uh, into power, promising a very large part of their election platform was free education. And they actually go ahead and immediately they come into power, they introduce free primary education. So from 2003 to currently 2016, we've actually had free primary education. But then the question that I pose on the central premise of my paper is, has it been a success? Maybe in terms of longevity, it has been a success because, I mean, 2003 to 2016, that's a lot more than we had previously. But if you go into the detail of especially the quality of education that is being offered, then there's a very, very big problem. Okay, so 2004, that's when things started happening in education in Kenya. We even made it to the Guinness Book of Records, yay for us, uh, because we had the most, uh, the oldest person ever to enroll in primary education, a man called Kimani Maruge, who was identified uh, for that particular purpose. And of course, when he was interviewed, and there were many interviews around this uh, man before he died, he mentioned that with the free primary education, he'd always wanted to go to school, but he never had the opportunity, the money, and so on and so forth. But with FPE, it became possible for him to actually go to school. Now, the biggest problem with FPE as it was implemented and as things stand right now is quality. I mean, at least in as far as my research is concerned. You can see that is an example of a class. I don't even know how many students are in that class. There are barely enough seats for all of them. There's hardly any writing material. And this is the position all through the country in as far as public primary schools are concerned where FPE is actually being given. So then the starting point now is that um, thinking about the CSR general comment number 13, they mentioned that for all education and emphasis now on primary education, we'll only be able to say that it's an effective way of implementing the right to education if four factors are actually met. So availability, that means that you have to have educational uh, it's possible for people to access education. So within this context, I mentioned there that we are failing in as far as that particular criteria is concerned because we don't have enough public schools. And the public schools that we do have are very, very um, strained in as far as resources are concerned, they're overcrowded in as far as the number of students are concerned and all that. Accessibility is another criteria to assess whether the, any education, the right to education is being effectively implemented in a particular country. Again, we fail on this score because the requirement is that education should be economically accessible, physically accessible, and then, the, of course, the issue of non-discrimination. So economic accessibility, yes, because it's free public education, that's fine. But in terms of physical accessibility, we are failing because, I mean, there's not enough schools, like I've already mentioned, and the few schools that are there are overburdened. There's also acceptability, and one of the criteria that we have to look at and the acceptability of education is the quality. And again, like I've already mentioned, quality is the biggest issue as far as uh, my research is concerned. Adaptability, so there's need to change 
you know, so that education can always be able to adapt to the unique situation of the community in question. So for a very long time, since about 1985, we've had a system of education called 844. That means we spend eight years in primary school, four years in secondary school, and then we go straight to university education for another four years. The system has proved very difficult, and as recently as maybe two weeks ago, the government has passed a new policy saying that we are going to move from 844 to what they're calling 2633. So two years in uh, pre-primary, and then six years in primary, then three years in high school, and then three years in university. Let's wait and see how that works out in as far as uh, <clears throat> the overall effect on the system is concerned. So now, the, the, the biggest problem is that if you look at public schools and private schools, there's absolutely no comparison in as far as quality is concerned for obvious reasons because public schools are overcrowded, they're underfunded, and therefore the beneficiaries of the system are actually not benefiting in any material way from the way the system is currently being administered. If you can afford to take your kids to private school, then of course it means that your kids will get better education. That means better opportunities later on. And because of this, the central premise of my article is that the current way through which the right to education is being fulfilled in Kenya is actually widening the inequality gap because you have the people who are in the good schools and for them the education is okay. That means that they have better life opportunities. But for the people who are going to the public school system and getting free primary education, you can hardly argue the same because after all is said and done, what we're doing is exacerbating uh, intergenerational poverty because like someone mentioned, one of the earlier panelists, by the time you're done as a um, beneficiary of the free primary education system in Kenya, you will not have as easy access as private school students would have to maybe secondary education and even uh, tertiary or university education after that. So some of the biggest failures of the FPE policy currently, there are lots of delays in funds disbursement. There are different accounts to which the FPE is administered. Ideally, the government is meant to give about uh, $14 to per, per student to every school, so aggregated over the number of students who are actually uh, present at that particular time. And the money is usually disbursed three times in a year, but there's a lot of... Um, delay between when the, 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 the headmasters or headmistresses report that students have reported and when the money is given. So during this particular period of time, you have students who are in school, there's no material for them to, to use in terms of textbooks and facilities are not being adjusted upwards in as far as the number of students are concerned, so it becomes a big issue. We have teacher shortages. Like I said earlier on, FPE was more of an election promise than a well-thought-out policy. That meant that the government or the government-to-be just woke up one day and said, hey, if you elect us into power, we'll give you free education. But then they didn't think about the fact that, okay, if we're going to have public education increasing in this kind of scope, you need to hire more teachers. So now we have very, very severe teacher shortages. And even the teachers who are there are so poorly paid that strikes are commonplace in, in, in Kenya. Every other day you have a strike, and when one group strikes, and perhaps they are able to strong arm the government tomorrow the next group will strike. So it's a big issue. Lack of adequate learning materials and physical facilities as well. Corruption, the bane of our existence, I think. We have, we are one of the most, well, not, let me not say we, but Kenya is ranked as one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And as you can imagine, this affects every sector, education, uh, no exception. Lack of managerial skills, the teachers who are there were not properly trained in financial management before they were told, okay, here is money, here is the money that you use for administration of the FBE system. So we have a big problem in that as well. And the quality of education, as you can see, is unacceptably low. So then now coming to the key reason why I think my, uh, my paper kind of ties in very well with the theme in the conference, I argue that, look, FP is actually contributing to a widening of the inequality gap in Kenya. Why? Because the beneficiaries of the system are not benefiting from the policy in qualitative terms. Quantitatively, yes, but qualitatively, no. Why? Because availability of education is not synonymous with learning. There have been many reports that have been carried out, and uh, perhaps the data will be available in my paper, um, that if you do, if you interview students, who have gone through the FP system, maybe you interview a class eight student and try to assess their literacy and numeracy, you'll be surprised to find, or not so surprised as the case may be, to find that the literacy levels and numeracy levels are probably for a grade two student. So you've gone through the whole system, but you do graduate, you'll have your papers, but at the end of the day, you're not significantly better off than you were before you joined the system.
So because of this, those who can afford it will move from public to private schools. So we have, uh, we've had a mushrooming of low-cost private schools to try and beat the fact that public education system is actually failing our students. So then the net effect is that we have an acceleration decline in the average socioeconomic status of public school students, something that has been mentioned before. Of course, this coincides with the fact that we have ridiculous student-to-teacher ratios or teacher-to-student ratios. You'd find a class where you have one teacher and the teacher has to teach about 300 students cramped in a class. So, of course, there's no room for personal attention and all of these things which then uh, makes the problem even bigger. There's a large performance gap between private and public schools. In Kenya, currently, we have national exams administered at the primary school level. So we have the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education. At the end of your eight years in primary school, you have to do a national exam. At the end of your four years in primary school, you have to do one national exam as well. And then this determines whether you move from primary to secondary and then from secondary to university. As you can imagine, performance has been that over the past couple of years, the KCPE uh, candidates who sit and pass primarily come from pub, uh, private schools, it's not from the public schools. And even those who make it from the public schools, by the time they do well enough to qualify to go to secondary school, now they're stuck because they don't have money to go to good secondary schools. Or even if they can, when they get there, they're not able to compete considering the fact that the quality background is not the same as private school students. So uh, again, that big brings up the issue of the performance gap that I've mentioned. So essentially, my, type, uh, my paper is titled Learning to be Poor, which is what I think the FP policy is actually accomplishing in Kenya. Because the biggest crisis is that the success of the education system is being measured not in terms of tangible you know, learning outcomes, such as you know, what a student is able to do after going through the FPE system, but in terms of the fact that, oh, over the past couple of years we've had FPE, so it's been 13 years this year, let's have a big party and celebrate the fact that we have free education in Kenya. Or let's think about enrollment figures, and the Kenya Bureau of Statistics churns out figures on a um, ridiculous basis, much, fa much faster than the government provides any other services that they are required to. They'll always give us statistics saying that, okay, look, this year we had enrollment rates shooting from, I don't know, 20% to 50% to from this percent to this percent and so on and so forth. But that kind of increase without, you know, looking at the quality aspect doesn't really uh, mean that the right to education is actually being uh, achieved or realized. So the school system is producing illiterate and semi-illiterate children. They don't acquire the foundational skills that will enable them to compete favorably outside of the school environment. So they're ill-equipped for both secondary education as well as university education. So then now that means that it's trickling into everything else. So my focus is on primary education, but probably there's room for a whole other discussion on secondary education as well and tertiary education. Because what is happening right now is that we have commercialization of education in Kenya. Over the past couple of years, I think we've moved from having only seven universities to having about 25 universities. The government is giving licenses to private individuals left, right, and center. And then what that means is that private universities and some private universities at that are willing to accept any student as long as they can pay regardless of their quality background and as far as primary education and secondary education is concerned. So you'll meet all sorts of university graduates from Kenya, okay, um, uh, present company excluded, let me see. They have papers, but when you sit down and interrogate the kind of quality of education that they have had, it's not adequate. And you see, this is not the fault of the student, it's the fault of the system and the implementation all the way from the primary education system to the tertiary education system. And so it goes then that the rich get and their children who can attend private schools get richer and the poor get poorer. Or as my economics professor used to say, the rich get richer, the poor get children. And the cycle of life continues. It's a very cynical view to adopt, but I think all of this can be traced to the fact that the current way through which of, um, free primary education is being implemented in Kenya is that we have a very high opportunity cost for someone who chooses to go to a public uh, institution to get FPE. So then I pose the question there, is any education better than no education? I don't think so because, yes, so I'm, I'm out of time. I'll wrap it up very, very quickly. The opportunity cost of FPE is unacceptably high for the beneficiaries of the system in its current form. And I think unless the government takes measures to reform the system, think about the policy, think about the funding, um, 
and perhaps restructure that in subsequent years, the system will continue producing half-big people who are not able to compete favorably in society, which means that the inequality gap will keep widening. Thank you very much. The way forward is mentioned there as well, but I think these are points that have been mentioned by most of my other colleagues, so I don't need to rehash them. The biggest problem is political will, as, uh, as you can imagine, and perhaps with subsequent governments or you know, we can only hope that um, with better organization of the education system in Kenya, then these things will change. But until then, FPE is a bigger problem than it is a solution. Thank you. So uh, thanks, and um, I should say actually, um, I want to echo Dan's call in the last session. Um, if people can't see the slides, um, encourage them to, to move uh, forward so you'll be able to see the, the slides better. I know this is not the sort of giant projector we sometimes have. Also, um, my background is in philosophy, which is actually more of a handout than a slide-based culture. So I, I haven't had have copies for everyone, but um, try to share with your neighbor, especially folks in the back. Hopefully, we'll find the, the handout um, helpful. So um, this uh, general project on um, looking at um, uh, status maintenance and then looking at um, the alternative of what I call adequacy plus mobility is one that I've um, presented to several the different audiences, uh, people in, in, in philosophy, in law, um, in medicine actually, and this is the first time I'm presenting it to a sort of human rights focused audience and incorporating this aspect of human rights, so I'm going to be especially interested to see um, what your responses are. Um, so I begin with the taxonomy of um, three potential aims of social programs, not an exhaustive taxonomy, but three aims that I think are especially interesting. And um, this taxonomy isn't originally mine. Um, the uh, metaphor that um, I find really interesting at the core of it is actually due to Elizabeth Anderson, who's a political uh, philosopher and, and feminist epistemologist at the University of Michigan. And the, the three aims that um, get distinguished in this taxonomy are the first is this idea of having social programs that are um, adequacy ensuring. So uh, the metaphor there is that the programs are safety nets. They guarantee an adequate social minimum. Um, the next category um, are programs you might call climbing ropes. Um, they ensure that individuals are able to move up from the position they currently are in. And then the third category, the category that I'm going to be more more critical of in this presentation, is um, what Anderson uh, and I call bungee cords. So programs whose structure is that they ensure that individuals don't drop too far below the highest position they've they've reached. I think on the hand, I say the highest place they've they've climbed. You might also say the the place where they ended up being dropped drop, dropped down or parachuted in. And um, uh, in terms of inequality, which is our, sort of one of our thematic focuses here, I think the first two species of programs um, have positive effects for equality. So the safety nets set limits on inequality in the short term, and mobility um, reduces over the long term and especially intergenerationally inequality. In contrast, um, status-maintaining programs can serve to entrench longer-term inequality. So um, this uh, slide here is sort of just a... A, a graphical illustration of the same point, and it's very, it's very, very stylized. But the basic idea is that a bungee cord structure, if you imagine the blue distribution being the one before some sort of change and the red one after the, the change, uh, the, the bungee cord program um, bases your, di your distribution in the future on how much you enjoyed in the past. Whereas a safety net type distribution um, bases how you're doing in the future on um, keeping everybody um, above some standard of adequacy. Um, and so now turning to this other thematic focus we have, which is this um, focus on human rights, I was interested um, here in thinking about um, how um, human rights regimes serve to um, further each of these um, three purposes. So starting with this uh, question of status maintenance, um, in the right to social security, you see some language that I think suggests um, a connection with this status-maintaining bungee cord purpose. So um, language about um, 
income maintenance schemes in some of the general comments. Um, another that uh, stood out to me was this um, uh, example in another general comment of there being a requirement that there be a reasonable relationship between um, earnings, paid contributions, and the amount of relevant benefits. So you can imagine something like that um, making it more difficult to do something like uh, relaxing the, getting rid of the cap on Social Security tax, say, in the U.S., without um, providing a comparable amount of benefit. And then the last is this language from this um, ILO document that says the fundamental aim of Social Security, so interpreting the, the, the content of this right, is to um, give people and families the confidence that their quality of life, their standard of living, won't be eroded by change. So it's not that it guarantees you adequacy, it's that it guarantees you that if there are changes, you're not going to drop down. And the last, um, this is uh, just looking around at, at other places, I, I found it interesting that the World Bank, when they talk about displacement and resettlement, they state the, one of the uh, things that's required is that uh, what you need to be able to regain is the previous standard of living. So again, it's this structure where it bases what you receive on the future and what in, on what you enjoyed in, in the past. Um, in contrast, um, you also see in human rights documents um, uh, emphasis in a lot of places on this notion of adequacy. So um, in a bunch of human rights documents, you see this language of being entitled to a standard of living adequate for um, health and well-being. Um, and you also see this language about a right to adequacy and the right to social security. So the idea that uh, benefits need to be adequate in amount and adequate in duration. Um, and then thinking to the U.S. Pacific uh, context, I was interested in um, looking at, at the U.S. history at um, Roosevelt's Second Bill of Rights. So you have here, I think, quite a bit of an emphasis on this adequacy uh, picture where the idea is an adequate way to and decent living, a decent home, a good education. The economic protection, the fifth line there, it might be a little more ambiguous whether it's status maintenance or adequacy that's being um, promised. Um, and then the last is this uh, question of where um, economic mobility, the, the possibility of moving up and of ch changing places over time comes in. And this is less prominent, I think, in human rights. So the best I could find is this reference to equal opportunity to be promoted in employment over time. But this is equal opportunity, which is sort of the chance to move up, but it doesn't assure that you're actually going to get mobility. Uh, the other that I found interesting regarding this question of mobility was the reference to the right of everyone to the continuous improvement of living conditions. And this seems ambiguous between two different readings that make a big difference to whether we think of them as status maintaining or um, instead mobility and adequacy uh, focused. And if you think of it as each person's individual rights, you are going to have a sort of status maintaining structure because then if I started out doing well, I have a right to never be, be dropped down by social or economic change. You get the sort of conservatism of human rights, the focus on um, sort of preserving property and contract arrangements that some of the speakers talked about in earlier panels. In contrast, if you thought about it as a population-wide or a collective right, you could allow for social mobility within the human rights frame. So the next thing I was interested in um, after setting up the taxonomy was trying to explore the best case that I could find for why people might think uh, status-maintaining policies were justified. So one um, answer that's out there is this idea that maybe um, a notion of uh, merit or desert is what justifies status maintenance. So sometimes people argue that uh, receiving income entails deserving the maintenance of that income level into the future. Um, but I think even there's a pretty broad consensus, actually, that in a lot of cases, receiving income might be warranted on grounds, say, of efficiency or of other grounds, but that there's not a deep moral desert to this income. And that even when re receiving income does um, equate, let's say, to morally deserving income, what I want to argue is that it doesn't support additionally not only saying we'll give people income or wealth, but we'll maintain that income or wealth over time. Um, another argument that I see that sort of references this, this dessert idea is that maybe uh, paying more taxes entails getting more social insurance in exchange for what you pay. Um, but you have a lot of programs, um, Medicare in the U.S. I think is like this, where you don't get more from the programs uh, just because you've paid more in. So normatively, I, I, what, I want to raise questions about the foundation of the sort of earnings or payment in to benefit out proportionality that you see discussed in some of those earlier um, human rights comments. Um, 
The next argument that I see, um, this I see especially actually reading some of the work of sociologists like um, Richard Sennett actually, is that maybe we need uh, status maintenance, stability of income or growth over time to be able to plan our lives. Um, what I want to suggest in response to that is that um, I think this gets a lot of its force from the idea that without status maintenance, you're going to be plunged into catastrophic, disastrous poverty. If you have adequacy and if you have mobility, um, I think that can eliminate the possibility of this sort of catastrophe. The other point is just that there are opportunity costs to status maintenance, so that um, even if it might be good for some people in their life plans to have status maintenance, um, there might be better uses for resources, more compelling uses, than protecting the status of people against uh, losses due to change. Again, this comes back to this question about the sort of con conservative bias of uh, certain sorts of ways of framing human rights. Uh, the third argument that I sort of see out there is this argument of solidarity, that everyone benefits from these programs. They build solidarity between different citizens. And I worry about this in three ways. The first is that this is actually an argument I first saw in some work of Goodwin Lewis. If you have universality, it's not clear that you need this status-maintaining structure. The next point, and you have this quote from the sociologist John Miles um, on your handout, is that disadvantaged people don't uh, end up benefiting necessarily very much at all from status maintenance. And as um, here again, I think Bill Simon has done work on social welfare systems um, that suggests that actually status-maintaining structures can weaken solidarity between those with prior status who are benefiting from these systems and those who lack that that status. Then the last argument for status maintenance is that perhaps it improves productivity. Now this is an empirical question, not a conceptual question, and so beyond my remit largely here, but the two points I want to make on this are that first it can only support a contingent right to maintain status. So you maintain status insofar as its benefits outweigh its costs. The second is that uh, some demands for status maintenance might be distinctively unjust. They might take the form of a demand not just uh, to be paid in order to produce or something, but to be kept above others. And those sorts of demands might warrant um, resistance even at the cost of productivity, potentially. Um, so then I want to turn to two potential classes of responses um, we might have to the extent we're persuaded by the arguments that I've offered that are critical of status maintenance. Uh, one is that maybe we should dis dismantle status maintenance. So if we can get other programs that achieve a decent social minimum plus intragenerational and intergenerational social mobility, status maintenance actually entrenches inequality over time because it prevents downward mobility from the top. So you have... Um, uh, I think I saw an op-ed in the New York Times by Richard Reeves at Brookings, the glass floor problem, where you have the problem that once you get up under status maintenance, there's no dropping down. Um, but there are also um, other ways of thinking about status maintenance that are less radical, where you might think, even if we're not going to get rid of it, we might change it in different ways. So I talk about these four approaches as unbundling, smoothing, capping, and uh, resilience. So, the first unbundling is maybe you can break apart different aspects of status. So you could say maybe we preserve people in their residence without saying that you need to preserve the status of home, home ownership across generations, say. Another is that you smooth status transition. So you say if you're used to a higher status, we drop you down slowly, but we don't say that we keep you there in perpetuity. Another one, um, Michelle Dickerson and I are actually talking about this after the, the panel that referenced bankruptcy, is capping the amount of status maintained. So you maintain status up to some level, but you relax its protections beyond that. This kind of relates also to an idea that uh, Dan talked about in one of the previous panels about um, scale sensitivity versus scale blindness and the way we think about property. And the last one, um, there's been sort of a theme thinking about degrowth and some of these other things throughout the conference, is this idea of encouraging resilient plans of life, plans that don't require so much individual status maintenance and instead are achievable um, by reliance on more public purposes and public resources. Um, so then in, in, in closing, I want to turn to just thinking a little bit about the politics of status maintenance and why I think it's, it's complicated and it's interesting. Because you see actually, I think, um, support across the political spectrum for replacing status maintenance with adequacy and with mo mobility. So you actually see, I think I saw this in an article of Nancy Fraser's actually, that a sort of a, a standard commitment at the core of a sort of liberal notion is that you're hostile to 
entrenched hierarchy. And so um, Roberto Unger's idea of destabilization rights, um, some of the work of Bruce Ackerman and Ann Allstott on, on, on stakeholding, um, suggests that we might focus more on adequacy on mobility instead of status maintenance. You also see a different part of this same sort of liberal commitment in a sort of right liberal rather than left liberal form in um, both um, Hayek and Friedman actually were in certain readings of them at least friendly to some version of adequacy and mobility, although their conception of the content of adequacy was going to be much less uh, broad. But you also have this broad support on both sides, maybe of a large political spectrum, um, multiple sides, maybe not both, of, of, for, for, for keeping status maintenance. So you have the ILO definition that I referenced, um, some of the work of people like um, Jacob Hacker has this sort of feel to me. And then on the other side, you have right-wing populism and a sort of Burkean hierarchical conservatism that you see right now, I think, especially salient in, in, in U.S. politics, where the promise is, um, what, I'm, what we're going to do for you as right-wing populists is we're going to maintain your status. We're going to protect you against change. We're going to make things the way they were for you before and keep you from being having a decrement of status. So the last thing, um, what I think is the, the promise maybe of rethinking status maintenance is that we see, see two aspects of modern society that, that are concerns for a lot of people. So the increasing stickiness of low and high status, that you have much less mobility down once you get to the top, harder to break out of the bottom. You also have these increases maybe in social change, changes in economic risk. And one question is whether by moving away from status maintenance, we can allow some of the tides of social change or economic risk to buffet the better off while using adequacy and using mobility to ensure that the worst off do adequately well and have a chance to, to move up in this tidal environment. And so we can use this latter phenomenon to cancel out the problem of the former phenomenon. Um, so thank you all very much, and I'm looking forward to questions. So I, I believe there are microphones circulating if people have questions. There may not be microphones circulating. Uh, who has a microphone? Uh, is there one in the room? Or why don't we proceed without microphones initially, sir, in the black sweater? Um, I want to throw, um, there's something into this uh, uh, discussion. Open up. I'm sorry, sir. I think a microphone is now coming, so that way we can record it. Yes. Uh, I wanted to throw something into this and ask uh, uh, everyone to respond if they want to, including uh, uh, Professor Markovitz. Um, there's a, a recent picture that's come out, a uh, documentary. It was done by a guy here at the University of Texas called uh, Starving the Beast. Uh, and it's about the how universities, um, public universities, uh, there are enormous cutbacks in funding coming from the legislature. And as a result of that, there's been this impetus to reform, except the reform is all this kind of neoliberal stuff uh, that, uh, you know, just run the university like a business, you know, and, and the reorganization of, of, of public universities uh, to a certain extent has followed that. There's been huge disputes here in Austin and in Virginia, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, they've changed it enough to take away tenure, although they haven't actually done that yet. Uh, and one of the comments that was made, you know, in this debate here um, locally was um, one of the regents, actually, who was the chair of the Board of Regents, says, you know, He's saying this in Austin to the University of Texas. We don't need an Impala. A Biscayne is fine. Uh, and it's to, uh, to a certain extent, uh, you look for these cost efficiencies and everything, online learning and all that kind of stuff, and apply them into a, a major university. Now, uh, I was curious about this, and there's one other factor. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. But... Um, Remember this medical school, elite, really elite education, the tax structure to fund it is being taken out of the local tax base, public schools, pushed over to a medical school with a statewide 
emphasis so that you don't have enough as much resources here locally. Um, so they'll look for public funding on that and the fact that it's happening in a liberal jurisdiction and everything, that doesn't bother the region. So um, I'm kind of interested in how this kind of change that I think is coming in higher education in public universities, public, major public research institutions, how this fits in uh, to maybe creating a double track that dumb downs, uh, dumbs down higher education um, structurally. And also, this is not coming from any kind of autonomous <coughs> superstructure. This is the needs of capital. Hey, we need this medical school for research, all right? That's, I didn't understand everything you were saying, but I got enough of that to, to ask that question. So, um, so I was actually interested in, in responding to that by way of asking Caroline a question that I think relates to it, which is that in um, fighting against um, some of these, I think neoliberalism is sometimes a, a vague term, at least to, to, to my ears, but in fighting broadly neoliberalism, being concerned not to go back to hierarchy, and my question that I found interesting is that whether an intervention increases or decreases inequality is often going to depend on within which population we're measuring it. So when you talked about um, the fact that FPE increased inequality within public education, I thought that's a very nice point. But one thing that also might be true, and I'm interested in sort of your, your thought about this, is that um, if we look at inequality overall between people who aren't in, edu in, in any education at all and people within education, that might go down. So when I think about universities, say that UT had a program to bring in many more students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, um, that would increase socioeconomic inequality within UT. But I would think that would actually be a good thing because it would decrease overall inequality. So I'm sort of interested in how we um, maybe fight against some of the, the bad aspects of this without going back to sort of a hierarchical picture. Um. <clears throat> I think if you if you do think about it that way, then it makes sense that overall FPE, sorry, so overall FPE has resulted in perhaps an overall reduction in inequality. But you see, the focus of my research is that there's a high opportunity cost in actually choosing to go through the free primary education system because traditionally what could happen, or not traditionally, but as an alternative to FPE, we have... Um, these students who are now in the school system where they're not benefiting out of the system could be using this time in alternative things. And in fact, if I had gone through the final slide where I talk about the way forward, I mentioned that potentially the government in Kenya should think about investing in alternative sectors other than FPE. So encourage people to take part in uh, what we call Juakali industry, which is an informal industry where you don't need education, but the government funds and then people are able to get into apprenticeship and stuff like that. So then if you think about it from this particular perspective, you see that the problem with FPE as it currently stands, the policy problem behind it is that the system is not well conceived. And if it's not well conceived, the overall effect is not good, which potentially answers that part of your question. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer your question. I don't know too much about uh, American universities, but I can talk um, briefly about British universities. So in, in the UK, there's kind of an EU-wide pressure for more and more students to go to university. However, what's happening in the UK is that uh, working class or poorer students, although they're go increasingly going to university, they'll be going to the poorer universities. So one statistic that I thought was quite damning uh, this year, so 10,000 people went to Oxford uh, started this year, only 44 were free school meal students. So that's kind of a, a big disparity between people going to uh, Oxford and Cambridge. And um, the, the two points I'd like to make about this is that Research shows that when a poor, poorer student and, uh, say, someone that went to private school get the same grades, the poorer student actually does better at university because they've had to work harder at school. So uh, for, I can only talk about my experience, but when I was doing my GCSEs, so kind of when your exams when you're 15, 16, we didn't have a maths teacher. If you don't have a maths teacher, how are you going to pass the maths exam? So if you, uh, so, that, so that's one of the things. Um, and in terms of, and then there's also something that links to that. Because increasingly people are going to university, 
There's also um, people that don't go to university, so the poorest students that don't even get to university, they're also disadvantaged because then they're struggling to get jobs because now more and more people have degrees. So things that you wouldn't need a degree before, before people have degrees that are doing them, so they can't even get those jobs, so they're struggling to get those jobs. Um, and yes, yeah, so I think the way higher education is working in the UK at the moment uh, is, is low in standards and it's not particularly good um, for socioeconomic inequality. That's what I think that answers the question. Okay. Um, next question. Actually, I have uh, two uh, more quicker concrete questions. The first one was for David. Uh, you mentioned as one of the enforcement mechanisms these um, uh, school, I um, can't remember the term, but it sounded more like an administrator type of person. Uh, well, the general comments of the ICSCR say to uh, effectively enforce these rights, you need to have quasi-judicial mechanisms. And so if you're, you're right now you're promoting an administrative <laughs> role, is there another outlet, is there another way to have a quasi-judicial aspect, or is that just not really practical in uh, UK as of right now? And the second question is for Caroline. I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate on this one. Um, so you're criticizing the FPE as it exists. Well, Liberia recently privatized its an entire educa primary education system. It, it gave the rights to all of it to uh, uh, bridge international academies, I believe. Uh, there's no user fees, so for students there's no change in that regard, but this company says they're going to provide these schools in a box which gets around the teacher shortage problem. Would you recommend, <coughs> can you do the same? Can I go first, David? Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> so, absolutely not. I'm not calling for privatization of the public education system. All I'm saying is that the government is not doing enough in as far as the implementation of the policy is concerned. So they need to rethink the policy itself because, I mean, I, I may come off as though I'm anti-FPE and I think it's done more bad than good, but I actually think that, like uh, Govin pointed out with the question that he directed to me, that it has had its benefits. And in fact, in my paper, I do go through a session where I look at the successes of the FPE. My key concern is that in qualitative terms, the current way that the government is running the system, it's actually uh, detrimenting the students in the sense that when they are done with the system, they're not able to compete effectively. So maybe if we could change the policy, maybe if we could now going into broader issues, reduce corruption, have better disbursement of funds, train the, you know, the school committees because we have school committees better, and then ma make sure that you know, we have more transparency, accountability, and so on and so forth, the system could actually work. So as it stands, no privatization, public system, yes, but a better, a more efficient public system of education would be the solution. Well, very is it bigger problem the lack of resources or poor implementation? Not lack of resources. In the last year, we had a budget, and we were talking about tax policy, which I found interesting yesterday and as well as today in the morning. Our budget was, I think, 1.8 trillion uh, Kenya shillings. Out of that, 27% was allocated to education. The resources are not the problem. The implementation is the problem, which is the perennial Kenyan problem, I think, a big problem in a lot of developing countries as well. Um, my answer is very quick. So I, I'm not saying that you, you don't need the justiciable mechanism. So I, I, would, I still think you need courts. But my problem is that a lot of researchers just focus on um, kind of the argument of whether socioeconomic rights can be justiciable. I think they can be. Uh, and then they'll look at the problems with courts and needs to reform courts, etc., which, which is good. But uh, my argument is that even if we had perfect courts that enforce socioeconomic rights, often on the very ground level, the, these are the people that make the big decisions. They can be very small decisions, but they have a huge impact on socioeconomic inequality. And so we need to focus on other bodies, so regulators as, as alongside courts, and look at how they can m uh, make sure that people are... Uh, keeping their right commitments, uh, complying with the quality law, etc. Great panel. I have uh, two questions, actually. First of all, there's a common thread going through, I think, all of the, the, the debates over the past few days around whether human rights is somehow counterproductive um, in fighting economic inequality or other forms of inequality, as it only really focuses on a, a basic minimum core. Um, and therefore displaces pressure to equalize through different policies or, or other things. Um, and I think the example you gave in Latin America on education is an interesting one. Uh, there are certainly uh, big problems that you mentioned. Um, but if you actually talk to the people that are working on the right to education in Latin America, many of our partners, they, were say, they will say, and this is across the board in many middle-income countries, the problem is not 
uh, human rights at all. In fact, what they're fighting for is the human right to quality education, not just availability of education. Um, a, a affordable education for all, uh, without discrimination. Um, uh, and, and so uh, I wonder, and this is, I guess, for, for Cal Caroline and Craig, whether it, 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 it's, it's human rights is uh, counterproductive, or in fact, it's a limited conception of human rights that's counterproductive. Uh, and a more uh, expansive view, which looks at all of these factors, uh, equality, affordability, accessibility, um, et cetera, is, um, and looks at the principles of progressive realization moving from the minimum core up, that's more of the solution, rather than just saying human rights is counterproductive uh, and, and let's just uh, leave it there, because I don't see any other uh, framework that would address these issues. And it would, in that sense, delegitimize the people that are working on these issues on the ground day in and day out from a human rights perspective. Um, the second question, um, just uh, interested in the UK perspective, we're starting to work with a lot of national human rights institutions, which, um, as some may know, are government oversight bodies uh, set up um, uh, in different parts of the world uh, to look at the human rights records uh, of, of a particular country. And many of them, not just in Europe, but particularly in Europe, are looking into these questions of economic inequality now, um, especially since the economic crisis. And they're trying to use human rights norms and procedures um, to get some traction on, on economic inequality. They're interesting bodies because they have more power than civil society over government. Um, some of them have public inquiry duties. Um, some of them are able to get uh, access to public information in a way that civil society doesn't. Some of them can even bring claims against government. Um, so I'm, much, I'm interested if you've had an experience with the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the UK and whether it's, it's had any impact on these issues. Why don't we go in the order of the questioners? Sure, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, you know, as to whether human rights is, is counterproductive as it relates to education and, and inequality, I would agree that the answer is no to that. In fact, uh, pointing just back to the fact that now there is universal primary education in, in Latin America, which obviously is not a, not a negative thing. Um, but in terms of access versus quality of that education, uh, I agree if, if we could frame, if we could stick uh, quality of education into the human rights framework, which I know some people do, uh, especially uh, in the past 10 or 15 years. I, I agree I, they, they have been uh, fighting for that in Latin America. The, the issue is when it comes up, when right to education litigation arises in Latin America, it's, it's typically been, I think always been, uh, in, in the context of, uh, of access, um, which there, there's a similar argument made in right to health litigation in Latin America. I think Dan Brinks stepped out, but um, Professor Brinks and, and um, Professor Forbath wrote about uh, right to health litigation as kind of in, in a similar light of we have these these rights that are, are litigable, you um, have a remedy for them, uh, but really it's either, um, you know, basic access that you're fighting for or those that can afford to litigate these rights, which again is going to be uh, middle class, upper middle class, um, and, and above. So I agree if we, if we can um, include Qualitative or quality education as, as a human right um, and, and fight for that. I'm, I'm just, I haven't seen it litigated. Maybe you have uh, other examples, um, and just speaking from a legal perspective, um, on, on where the progress is there. Caroline. Okay, so. Can you swing the mic towards you? <clears throat> Great. So, just like Craig, absolutely not. Human rights are not counterproductive to the discussion we're having. In fact, without the language of human rights, wouldn't even be able to critique, you know, the, what government policies such as free education are all about. And for instance, in Kenya before 2010, we didn't have our previous constitution did mention uh, socioeconomic rights. But then in 2010, the new constitution, it says specifically in Article 53, you have the right to education. And, you know, just by having this right mentioned in the constitution, it gives mm -hmm. impetus to the whole discussion. So people now are able to say to the government, look, we have these rights and this is what it means and so on and so forth. So then, if you think about now uh, the way you phrase your question, the problem is not the language of human rights, I think, but the problem is that maybe we need a broader conceptualization of human rights incorporating other things such as, like he's mentioned, structural changes to institutions because I think the biggest problem and the, 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 the key thing I keep going back to in my discussion is that the failure is on the part of the government in, um, in as far as the structures of government put in place to enforce FPE are actually concerned. FP is a noble idea. It's a great idea. If it was properly implemented, it would change everything about Kenya and future generations going onward. But the current implementation is the problem, and that's where we need to focus. So 
in as far as the discussion on minimum corn progressive uh, realization is actually concerned, I think our government always argues that, well, we've, we've done everything that is expected because, hey, we have FPE. So maybe that's the aspect of the minimum call, the minimum call being that we've introduced FPE. But we can still have progressive realization of the FPE right or the promised right to education by requiring the government on a yearly basis or on whichever other period basis to show what improvements they've made to the free education policy. Because as things stand, the last policy paper they published on FPE, I think, came out maybe in 2013. And it's almost a replica of the policy paper they had in 2003. So they're not making any tangible changes to the system. It's like once we, we've said we have FPE and once we allocate money in the budget to, you know, the free primary education program, then that's it. Our work is done. But I think they need to go deep and they need to be held to account by bodies like the Committee on Economic and Social Rights to be here. So given a comparison between 2003 and 2016, what changes have you effected since the coming in place of FPE? And if we do that, then the government will have to justify the qualitative measures they've taken to improve the free primary education, which is essentially what I'm calling for. So I've been given five minutes, which means, David, if you can be relatively quick, we yeah. can get one more question. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so answer you, your question. So I think the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the EHRC, um, potentially has a really important role to play. So obviously, with, with regulators, they have a lot of power but they don't have knowledge. So they don't particularly have a good understanding of what socioeconomic inequality is. They don't have an understanding of different conceptions of equality, so they tend to just um, look at purely at statistics, which misses a, a lot of things. So I think it's important that national human rights bodies support them in looking at these inequalities, because they're, kind of they're not doing it very well. In terms of the EHRC in the UK, um, it's not been very effective for, for two main reasons. So originally, there was three separate human rights bodies. So the one for disability, one for gender, one for race. 2006, they were combined into one that covered all seven grounds because they, they introduced four other grounds. And they've struggled to change the remit. There's been a lot of squabbling, etc. cetera. Um, and the other thing which is kind of key is their budget's been cut drastically. It's part of the austerity. So they've uh, had a 66% reduction in their budget. Um, so they've, they've had to be a lot less ambitious. They're, they're hardly, hardly bringing law cases. They don't do inspections. They've got all these powers, but they just don't have the resources to do it. So I think if we're going to properly do it, we need to properly fund the HRC. Shall we take one more question? Yes, I think struck, excuse me, by the absence of uh, discussion of technology as a game changer, and I'm just curious whether that will have an impact in terms of efforts to improve education, efforts to transcend uh, local interests and uh, create a broader approach to teaching students, for example, in classrooms, which now is subjected to 300 kids in the classroom. Like, what, do you, what roles do you see for technology? Caroline, why don't you start? Um, something interesting, when the Uhuru Kenyatta government, our current government, came in, they made a promise, one of the election promises was that, look, if you elect us, every primary school kid is going to get a laptop on the, you know, when we come into power. So the laptop promise is a big issue in Kenya right now. So they've actually allocated about one billion shillings for that as part of the FPE so that kids can be given a laptop. But then how do you give children in the rural areas a laptop and there's no electricity? Okay, then the government says, okay, we didn't think about it, but we've thought about it now. We're going to put solar panels and laptops will be charged using solar power. Okay, great. This is a kid who has never seen a laptop. They don't know how to use it. And the, 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 the places where the schools are, there's no security, so there have been instances where the laptops have been dispersed and then a child is walking to school with a laptop, it gets stolen. So, you see, technology does, I mean, it will be very important, but I think later on, after we've dealt with the key issues of the implementation of the system itself, the fact that we don't have, I talked about accessibility um, as one of the, 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 the CSR guidelines on adequacy of education and all that. Accessibility includes uh, physical accessibility as well, and they mentioned in the uh, general comment that security is a big issue. So let's have focus on, first of all, creating the institutions, making sure that we have enough schools, we have 
you know, the schools are secure for kids, they can be able to come to the schools and so on and so forth, and then we can focus on technology. I think it would be putting the cut ahead of the horse, is it, if we focus on technology before we deal with the issues of quality that are currently prevalent in the system. Um, yeah, I more or less agree. So um, the people premium has been used to give access for, for children to technology that they just couldn't afford themselves. So a lot of, a lot of schools have bought iPads that the students could use, uh, which obviously a lot of the wealthier students take for granted. Um, but at home they don't have a computer or iPad, so it, it's been helpful in that way. But I would say the same. It, it doesn't, although, although they can be useful, it doesn't um, address fully the issues. There's still kind of the structural issues, and they need lots of other support um, so kind of often it's more they might need behavioural support or extra teaching time. So uh, although technology can be useful, it, it doesn't kind of make up for those kind of things that they really need. Govind, would you like the last word? Um, I'm not sure I have a lot to say about technology specifically. I think one uh, question relating to technology is um, whether you have um, – Concerns about technology are being driven by, I think, the sort of concerns that were mentioned now about technology actually not doing well by the students who are very badly off, which I think is a really important consideration, or um, concerns about technology because um, people want to keep things the way that they've been done traditionally. And I think it's important to sort of untangle those two, but at the same time, I think sometimes support for one sort of um, there are coalitions of sort of uneasy bedfellows between the two species of critics of technology, those concerned about um, technology's um, inability to help the worst off without other sorts of financial and social support versus people who are concerned about technology because they're concerned about the way in which it might um, jeopardize their social position. And now let us arise and consult our own health and relax our minds from the severity of this discourse. Thank you. <laughs>